Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us on a gloomy Friday morning, but I think it'll be a much better to be in this room than in the rain outside. I think it'll be a fascinating day. My name is Francis Gesquier. I'm the head of the GFDR, and I'll be your master of ceremony today. And uh, we have a very, very packed schedule with six, uh, I think, fascinating speakers from Japan. So let's not lose any time. I'd like to uh, welcome at the podium uh, Mr. Koguchi, Katsuhiro Koguchi, uh, the Executive Director of Japan, for some opening remarks. Welcome. Thank you, Francis. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for uh, coming to this uh, the seminar, uh, Tech for Bosai. Uh, the Bosai means the, uh, the prevention of uh, disasters in Japanese. Uh, Japan, unfortunately, uh, is one of the, uh, the most exposed countries to uh, natural disasters in the world, from earthquakes, uh, typhoons, flooding, and volcano uh, eruptions. But we see uh, uh, natural disasters all over the world. Last year, so uh, hurricanes in the Caribbean islands, uh, earthquakes in Mexico, monsoon flooding in Bangladesh, and so on. And unfortunately, uh, frequency and intensity of uh, these disasters are increasing over the years, including uh, in many of the other uh, client countries. And this makes uh, building resilience against natural disasters one of the other uh, important development agenda. Uh, there are some positive aspects. Over the years, many countries have accumulated know-hows and developed technologies to uh, uh, reduce disaster risks. Japan is one of these countries. As you know, uh, the President Kim is very keen to apply advanced technologies or science uh, technology innovation, SDI, to address many of the other development challenges. And uh, we are very keen to uh, work with this uh, 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 President's initiative. Today, uh, we would like to showcase some of uh, Japanese know-hows and technologies for disaster risk reduction. I can safely say that the other uh, experts uh, who kindly uh, uh, traveled from Japan and making a, a, a presentation this morning. Uh, they are from uh, academics, uh, development community, and the private sector in Japan. Uh, these are the, uh, among the other uh, best qualified people. So I'm hoping that uh, in the future, there will be uh, uh, opportunities for the World Bank to collaborate uh, with these experts to put these know-hows and technologies into operations. I guarantee that uh, you will uh, enjoy the other uh, presentations, and it is worthwhile for you to spend your Friday morning in this seminar. Thank you very much. Let me invite Klaus Stilmes, who's a senior advisor to the president on this new initiative on disruptive technology. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you very much, Francis, and uh, thank you very much, Mr. Kogushi, for the opening comments. Welcome, everyone, and uh, I just want to say how pleased I am to see such a eminent uh, collection of expertise around the table. I think uh, this couldn't have been on a, a dreader day, but I think uh, in terms of just the expertise that is coming together, I just want to sort of go back and sort of say that actually reflects very much the longstanding relationship that we have had with Japan uh, in the area of disaster uh, reduction and response. And while a lot of the topic today will be on science, technology, and innovation, I want to sort of open this uh, in, a, in a way to a larger context. And that context is really about learning, about knowledge, about citizens, and about communities. And what I've taken away from this, and I have to say as somebody who has worked a lot in the area of knowledge, uh, the inspiration that I've taken from eminent knowledge experts like Professor Nonaka is to really appreciate the importance that Japan attaches to knowledge and the dissemination of knowledge. And in fact, as uh, Mr. Goguchi said, Japan's history is very much embedded and based on science, technology, and education. And throughout its history, Japan has learned how to rebuild and to recover uh, its economies and its societies uh, after exceptional disasters. And cities have been, uh, in many ways, a fulcrum for this type of learning. 
a source of learning that uh, really takes a very holistic view in terms of what recovery uh, is about and the practical implementation that is required in order to actually put this uh, into, um, into practical reality. Uh, the example of Kobe, I think, is one that uh, has given a lot of inspiration. It's a story of rebuilding after disaster, but with a vision that is really a reflection of practical realities of place, of time, of capabilities, and of matching that to the solutions uh, that are available. Japan's leadership role uh, at in this uh, particular time is both at the national as well as international level highly appreciated. Um, I've been to Japan over the last couple of months uh, three times and every time I've come impressed by the importance that the entire society attaches to the sustainable development goals. Uh, this is at the level of cities, it's at the level of government ministries, it's at the level of the private sector and increasingly it's also at the level of academia. What I've taken away from this is really a holistic understanding of what science and technology can offer uh, for dealing with today's problem. It is a, a concept that is embedded in a, a clear understanding of the role of society in terms of taking advantage of this. It's cross-disciplinary, and it is a role that really emphasizes the matchmaking of finding solutions that really address existing problems. Uh, I was very impressed to hear um, and to learn over the weekend from Japanese scientists that, for instance, uh, um, one of the national awards that Japan just assigned in 2017 uh, for the SDGs was given to uh, employment initiatives to find ways of bringing disabled people that were affected by disasters back into the, back into the um, productive employment world. Now, to make a connection, as Francis said, uh, President Kim has given uh, us the mandate to think through very creatively and very um, holistically what is the role of disruptive, exponential, transformative technologies for our mission. And we are working very closely with uh, Japan in this context. Uh, we are trying to articulate a corporate vision that sort of goes beyond what we currently do. And I know in the, particularly in the case of disaster, this team and our collaboration is well ahead of where must, much of the rest of the bank actually is. In some way, the disaster team uh, presents, and I see Margaret here, who was one of the first uh, creators of the disaster team in the bank 20 years ago, how much uh, this has actually shown how we can respond in an agile way, in a way that is fully networked, where we use technologies and where we use really a very rapid dissemination of knowledge to, uh, to address these uh, emergencies. What I really would like to call out for is we see really uh, in this um, next two years a very important collaboration with Japan uh, in the context of the G20 uh, 2019, in the context of Japan and Mexico co-leading the UN SDI forum where a big emphasis will be on um, how we can bring the scientists, the technologists, the innovators uh, together with policymakers to address the SDG um, dimensions. And, of course, uh, having just worked on Africa and Middle East, a uh, region that is very disaster-prone, I'm also uh, hoping that we will bring some of this experience uh, into uh, force when it comes down to the TCAT, uh, the uh, partnership between Japan, the World Bank, uh, and Africa in terms of really using this as a way of dealing with uh, many of the disaster dimensions. So I wish you an exciting day. Uh, I know it's going to be full with... Uh, scientists talking to policymakers, new technologies being uh, sort of bandied about, and uh, I'm really looking forward to continuing this. I should just say how important it is that the bank and uh, Japan have this partnership that also takes place through learning in Tokyo. I think the Disaster Hub is uh, one manifestation of how this learning is really part of our ongoing partnership. Thank you. Mr. Kogoshi and Klaus, thank you very much. I will move straight into uh, the various presentations. I'm going to welcome to the, uh, to the podium Dr. Satoru Nishisaka, who is the Executive Director of the Japan Center for Area Development Research. He'll say a few words about the enabling environment that has led Japan to eventually develop all this technology, kind of explaining why and how this has happened. We have six speakers today, so I'm going to ask the speaker to really uh, stick to their uh, allotted time, and we have a timekeeper there who's going to raise an orange flag and red flag when uh, the time, your time is up. So welcome, 
uh, to the podium. Good morning. My name is Satoru Nishikawa. Today I'm going to touch upon how Japan has strived to overcome disasters and how we have tried to incorporate as much as possible uh, science and technology for disaster reduction. Well, Mother Nature is not so gentle in Japan. We have a, a various types of natural disasters. So we have a long tradition of coping with disasters. The oldest written record of an earthquake dates back to year 416. The oldest written record of an earthquake and a tsunami dates back to year 684. It's written in the oldest history book of Japan. So we have something called the culture of disasters. It was said that the most dreadful things historically for children in Japan was Earthquakes, lightning and thunder, fire, and fodder. The force is no longer applicable, but this really represents how we have struggled with disasters. In the 7th and the 8th century, it was said that the most respected Buddhist priest was the best civil engineer. Gyoki, the high priest, and his fellow monks built dams for flood control and irrigation. And one of his dams still exist in Osaka as a water resource reservoir. The oldest high-rise wooden structure in Japan is a pagoda of the Horyuji Temple built in 680 AD. It has withstood numerous earthquakes and typhoons over the centuries with the combination of semi-flexible timberwork joints and a central wooden pillar which absorbs shocks. In the 16th century, it was said that the Lord who controls the river is the ruler of the land. There was a famous uh, samurai uh, warlord called Takeda Shingen who innovated uh, civil engineering techniques to absorb violent flooding. So these renowned Japanese priests and lords, why were they dedicated to disaster reduction? By introducing the flood control and irrigation technology, there would be fewer floods and droughts. That would mean greater rice produce, and it would lead to trust and fellowship by the locals and stability of the livelihoods of the locals. And that would enable them to expand their areas of influence. So they knew that disaster reduction is a must for sustainable development. This is a traditional ukiyo-e drawing uh, written right after the 1855 October Anse Edo earthquake. Edo is the old name of Tokyo. By this earthquake, most of Edo, Tokyo, was burnt down by the earthquake and the consequent fires. And this drawing shows how the ordinary citizens of Edo wanted to beat the monster catfish, which was believed to have caused that earthquake. This is a graph showing the number of casualties by natural disasters in the last 70 years in Japan. And you can see three epoch-making events. The first one was in 1959, the second was 1995, and most recently, the 2011 Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami. In 1959, the third largest city in Japan, Nagoya, was hit by a major typhoon. The flooding from upstream and the high tide and storm surge from the sea sandwiched the low-lying areas of Nagoya, resulted in more than 5,000 casualties. This was the first epoch-making turning point, and by this great typhoon damage, the Japanese government had a big argument on how to deal with disasters. So they changed their attitude from a response-oriented approach to a preventive approach. 
and from an individual approach to a comprehensive multi-sectoral approach and to invest for disaster reduction. Also, the three layers of the government in Japan, the national, prefecture, and municipal government were given responsibilities. Two years after the heated debate in the parliament, Japan came up with the Disaster Countermeasures Basic Act, and it has three major characteristics. The first is the Central Disaster Management Council, chaired by the Prime Minister, and this is a national coordinating body with all relevant ministers, and not only the government, the Red Cross, the public broadcasting, and other semi-public sectors, and the academia. And it called for involvement of semi-public private sectors like the utility companies, the railways, bus companies, forwarders, and broadcasting companies. Also, it made the duty for the government to submit an annual official report on disaster countermeasures to the national diet. And this comes with the budget for the next fiscal year and the statements of account for the previous fiscal year. Also, this act called for the formulation of the National Basic Disaster Management Plan for disaster prevention. And this enabled investment for disaster prevention, for flood control, land conservation, forest conservation, investment for meteorological observation, investment for emergency telecoms. Also on this occasion, the 1st of September was designated as the National Disaster Prevention Day. And thanks to these efforts, we were fairly able to control the casualties by uh, typhoons and flooding. Investment for science and technology. As you know, Mount Fuji is the highest peak in Japan. And because of its beautiful shape, it was worshipped as God in the historical days. But Japan Meteorological Agency made a good argument that instead of worshipping the mountain as a god, let's mount a meteorological radar to, for a better typhoon tracking. And they were successful. The 1961 Act formulated the Japanese National Platform for Disaster Reduction. And this is a list of the members of the Central Disaster Management Council. The Prime Minister is the chair. All the ministers of the cabinet is included. Also, the representatives of the Bank of Japan, the Red Cross, the public broadcasting, and the telephone company is there. Also, it should be noted that scientists, like the professor of geophysics or professor of sociology and media, are included in this uh, council. Of course, the prime minister is so busy that he cannot always attend these meetings. So there are special subcommittees or committees under this management council. And here, as you can see, there are various scientists, uh, NGOs, even CEO of business, major businesses are included. And this is a forum for the policymaker and the scientists and the private sector and the NGOs to have a direct dialogue on how to address disasters. This is a way to institutionalize science and technology into policy formulation. We have a lot of earthquakes, and here's a list of the major earthquakes from 1945 to 1995. In 1948, Fukui was hit by a major disaster. At that time, most of the Japanese houses were made of wood. So they collapsed with the earthquake and caught fire, and most of the city of Fukui was burnt down. In 1968, a major earthquake hit the northern island of Hokkaido in Japan. At that time, we were starting to use steel reinforced concrete structures. But as you can see from this picture, many of them were damaged. In 1978, Sendai was hit by a disaster. Every time these earthquakes came, the Japanese seismic building codes were revised. In 1981, based on the series of earthquakes, there was a major revision. 
And it's not enough just to have a building code. It has to be enforced. And many countries with earthquakes struggle how to have the building standards to be observed. In Japan, the government has a government-affiliated uh, GHLC, which is the, gives low-interest loans to good buildings, which are according to the building standard. And by having this low-interest loan incentive, construction companies and house owners, they wish to observe the building standard. And for the real estate development companies, it makes a big difference where the building they provide is according to the building standard or not, because it comes with the economic incentive. In 1995, Kobe was hit by a major earthquake, and this was the second epoch-making turning point. This is the headquarters of the Kobe municipal government. The building in the front is the old building, and the building in the back is new. As you can see, the difference. There are many lessons from this earthquake. The biggest lesson is the collapse of old houses built before the 1981 standard was the main cause of this. So how to reduce such damage is to have strong buildings. Also, because the uh, city of Kobe was directly hit, they had difficulties in the local government. The delay of first response due to the lack of information was a serious issue. Based on the lessons, seismometers were set around Japan. Prior to the earthquake, we only had 150 seismometers, but now we have more than 4,000. And this dense network of seismometers is the basis of the real-time earthquake early warning system that we have in Japan now. <laughs> also, there was a paradigm shift after the, this earthquake from a government-centered disaster reduction to a multi-stakeholder approach for disaster risk reduction. This is a recent ad which comes with my newspaper in my house, and it shows how this company can retrofit the old existing wooden houses to a new uh, strong house by applying some of their technologies. And people's demand for earthquake safety creates new supply of affordable engineering methods. How to create a win-win with the private sector? If the public at large appreciate the added value of safety and resilience and understand the science and technology behind the scenes, the expenditures for risk reduction would be regarded as investment for added value. Also, the 1995 earthquake uh, uh, encouraged us to further explore seismic engineering. The old techniques which were built, uh, which built the Horyuji Pagoda is now applied in the modern high-tech buildings. Prior to the 2011 earthquake and tsunami, scientists saw that there is a high possibility of such ocean tectonic earthquakes and tsunami. And there we had risk assessment of such possible disasters. But what we were prepared for a magnitude 8 earthquake and tsunami, but what came was a magnitude 9. The energy of a magnitude 9 earthquake tsunami is 32 times stronger than a magnitude 8 earthquake. There are many lessons from this disaster. It's no use crying over spilled milk, but we must make best of the lessons learned. There are several preventive approaches which were successful in decreasing the damage. The Japanese building codes showed its strength against the magnitude 9 earthquake. As you can see, this building is in the center of Sendai with the lights on. It means that it's functioning. 
Seismic retrofit of schools were done before the earthquake. So no structural damage to Sendai schools. Not a single child was killed in Sendai schools. Also, the city of Kobe, uh, no, no, the city of Sendai, they carefully learned the lessons from Kobe. And the Sendai City Hall was evacuated for one hour for safety inspection, but they had no structural damage because they had seismic retrofit of the city hall before the earthquake. So with these braces for seismic retrofitting, this saved the city hall and it served as temporary shelters. Also, we have some several applications of the latest technologies. All of the Japanese households with gas meters, they have this microchip controlled gas meter. And this is a safety mechanism to shut down gas in case of strong earthquakes. So there was no city fire in Sendai by gas leaks. Also, we have the real-time earthquake early warning system. And this takes advantage of the speed between the primary pressure wave and the secondary shake wave. And it's automatically aired on the public TV. And also this system uh, saved the Shinkansen bullet train to speed down and stop safely. Also tsunami warning was immediately issued. And the school children who were educated with disaster awareness programs, they ran to the high grounds. Massive evacuation was done. Approximately 500,000 people with in the tsunami Dante area. Majority of them escaped, but 20,000 did not make it. The mortality rate of the tsunami inundated area in the Indian Ocean tsunami was 40%. In the case of the Great East Japan earthquake was 4%. And this is a difference by having a tsunami early warning system or not. But there's always a pitfall in human response. Some people questioned do I really need to evacuate? And how can we motivate individuals to take preventive action? That's a big topic. So I have developed a, a program called Ichinichi Mai, the day before project. It interviews people who were severely affected by a disaster, who have responded to a disaster by posing the question, what would you do if you were back the day before the disaster? And they will start telling you how terrible it was, how they regret that they, they have not done something. And these are the examples, and they are used for public awareness programs in Japan. And this is an example of a mayor who regrets heavy drinking. When an alert of a volcanic eruption came to his office, he was drunk. And he was really regretting how he had failed to run to his office. There are new solutions based on the 2011 experience. As I said, the Shinkansen train was safely stopped by the earthquake early warning system. But it's based on a nationwide dense network of seismometers. But having, can that system be applied to save other important facilities. A new customized real-time earthquake early warning system was developed for countries who are not able to afford to have a dense network of seismometers. And this equipment can function as a standalone earthquake early warning system and can also function as a local earthquake early detection network with several installations. And this new technology is already applied in several locations in Indonesia. Now, how to create a positive cycle by applying the latest science and technology is the challenge that we face. Unless the latest technologies are applied, they do not show their real value. We have a saying in Japan, natural disasters will hit us 
by the time people have forgotten about it. The challenge is how to foster and inherit the culture of prevention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nishikawa, for setting the stage really for today's presentation. I'm going to call to the podium Professor Toshio Koike, an old friend from iCharm. iCharm is the International Center for Water Hazard and Risk Management. You'll tell us about some of the research at iCharm, some of the initiative that iCharm is part of. I think it's a broad program. Again, uh, time check, please. Um, try to stay in the time imparted. Thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Francis, and uh, thank you very much for your joining. Uh, the, in 2015, we had uh, three uh, global agendas, and uh, our science and technology community are requested to take a concerted action for uh, reducing the current risk and uh, preventing the future risk. And also the develop the adaptation recovery capability. Uh, this, the uh, action, the concerted action can make, uh, the, uh, can contribute to the uh, build the resilient society. This is an indispensable step for the sustainable development. Sendai framework says that we need to improve our understanding we need to strengthen the governance, we need to encourage the investment, and we need to promote the early warning and build back better. So the, in, uh, today I would uh, focus on uh, the uh, climate and water and uh, uh, disaster risk reduction in my talk today. So with regard to the uh, climate the, uh, change impact assessment, uh, in uh, the uh, geophysical sciences, we are developing the, the uh, process study and the models and uh, uh, implementing multimodal ensemble and downscaling bias collection and make uh, uh, input uh, into the society. But we need to uh, recognize the uncertainty in uh, our modeling capability. Those input is uh, used as a I uh, input uh, information for the hydrological models uh, for simulating the flood and drought, <laughs> uh, considering the, the uh, current facility and uh, plan and also the management structure. But water is not uh, the, uh, this uh, science and technology, uh, only science and technology issue. It's uh, closely related to the society. We need to consider the human activity and culture and history and economics. And then oh, we can uh, make uh, the assessment of the impact of the climate change on the water. And then we can propose the uh, adaptation options and uh, the policy make a, uh, make a decision. The implementation should be monitored and evaluated and reflect the result to the uh, next decision making. At this point, the decision making, as I mentioned, uncertainty there within the sciences that is very, very important. So this kind of the, the, uh, from science and engineering and the socioeconomical approach, end-to-end -end approach uh, is uh, critically important uh, on uh, the uh, for, for adaptation to the climate change. I will introduce the um, uh, uh, science and technology uh, the, uh, uh, development uh, in each stage with regard to the, the uh, uh, climate model. So this uh, figure shows that the uh, climatological uh, landfall, the distribution around the Philippines. So uh, 
the center that uh, the Lucent Island, we have a, a very clear land field. But the current, the climate model uh, can calculate in a various way in this uh, climate condition. This is past, not the future, past the simulation result. We have a large uncertainty in the model. We can make uh, the uh, conclusion on the, at the global scale, but the regional scale and the local scale, we still have a very big uncertainty. The very big the difference uh, between the actual situation and the model world. So when we apply the, this climate model to the, some specific region, uh, it's very difficult for us to say this is a good model, but we can exclude the bad model. So, so by using the, uh, some data system, we can evaluate the, the uh, model performance, and then we can select, which can, uh, select the models which can be used uh, the, uh, for the adaptation of our impact <laughs> assessment. So in this case, the uh, six models are selected. But the, even though such a model uh, has a, have a, the uh, big bias, Usually, extreme rainfall cannot be expressed uh, in uh, uh, the uh, correct way by using the uh, global scale model. And uh, model uh, generate every day, but weak rainfall. And a seasonal pattern uh, cannot be expressed uh, in a proper way. We need to collect the bias. After that, we can the. De- uh, get the, the a good relationship between the return period and the uh, rainfall intensity in present status, and then we can uh, the uh, pre- uh, project the future uh, the change in uh, the return period, and also the seasonal pattern. So uh, right hand side, the okay. Uh, right on side, the, uh, we have a six model output. Blue one uh, is the, uh, the observed the 10 year, 50 year, uh, 100 year rainfall in- intensity in the Lusun Island. And uh, 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 the red one is the future uh, the, uh, uh, rainfall of the each uh, return period. All of the selected six models showed a very big increase of the, this extreme rainfall. So that's why we have uh, some confidence on uh, the uh, increase of the heavy rainfall in future in this area. And then the, uh, we can the, uh, get the, the uh, correct the uh, model uh, output as average and uh, uh, compared the, uh, with uh, the future average and identify the, the, uh, the uh, difference, how much increase. So this is a case of 10-year probability, and uh, in the same way, the uh, same way we, we can get the, uh, for example, 100-year uh, probability, how much increase of the heavy rainfall in this area. So the, in this way, we can get the, uh, the uh, hazard change, uh, which can be introduced into the, our hydrological model. There are a lot of the hydrological models. Our iCham uh, they provide their open access their uh, models. Uh, this is IFAS uh, system. This is very simple, uh, spatially distributed tank model, uh, but uh, speci- simple but uh, very usable and understandable for many experts. So uh, we can the, provide this uh, system as a first step of the, their own management of, or their own planning of the, uh, the uh, flood. Uh, rainfall runoff inundation of the system, this is a 2D uh, uh, non-stable the flow, the uh, uh, diffusion wave the uh, system. So that's why we can calculate the, uh, not only the river flood, but also the inundation and uh, uh, the, uh, its uh, expansion of the flood. <clears throat> So by using this system and the climate model output, uh, we can uh, uh, the predict the, the how much uh, change of the each the extreme rainfall. And uh, the, 
Uh, also, we have uh, the uh, rainfall prediction system by the uh, regional climate model. Then we can develop the ensemble rainfall prediction by introducing the uncertainty into the model. By coupling the, the, uh, uh, the rainfall prediction system and the hydrological model, we can implement the ensemble flood prediction. So the, uh, the middle figure shows the, the, uh, the, the result. The uh, dot shows the observation. The, the uh, green line shows a single prediction. But uh, the uh, pink line is the uh, ensemble mean of the, the uh, flood prediction. So we can improve the, the uh, prediction capability. Hydrological processes, they consist of four components, basically. One is the uh, uh, land surface energy and water balance, and uh, the soil moisture dynamics, and uh, uh, the lateral flow on the slope, and river channel flow. These four uh, systems are connected. So by uh, using this, the uh, component model, we can expand the prediction capability uh, by coupling with, uh, for example, dam operation, or the snow and glacier model, or rice production, the wheat production model. So uh, the, uh, in this case, uh, we uh, coupled the uh, cl uh, climate model output and uh, uh, this model and the dam operation system. Uh, the upper figure is the 20-year simulation of the reservoir level uh, from the, uh, January 1st to the uh, end of December. And the uh, lower figure shows the future uh, from the 2046 to 2065 by inputting the climate model output as an input into the hydrological model. So uh, the sick line is the average of the 20 years their reservoir level. So this is 310 meter reference height. You can understand the average of the uh, reservoir level decrease. This is the uh, negative impact of the uh, water resources management. And uh, we set the maximum water level at the dam for, for the safety uh, of the dam operation. In past, of course, we, don't have, we didn't have a such a big the, uh, 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 increase of the water level, but in future, by using the uh, uh, same operation rule, the, we will have an uh, overflow from the dam. So, and the, this uh, the, uh, area, uh, this uh, part shows uh, the uh, high water demand season, and uh, uh, the, the bottom line is the uh, really empty level of the reservoir. So you can identify which uh, is a much more dense uh, lines. Yeah, future, the, uh, a lot of the empty uh, opportunity uh, uh, due to the uh, climate change. So this kind of the, the uh, simulation can be done uh, by coupling with the snow and the ice model. We can uh, calculate the very uh, the uh, uh, snow and the, uh, glacier melt discharge very well. Not only the such uh, the uh, data, uh, the hydrological data, but also the snow covered area. Uh, Usually, uh, for current simulation, we use uh, the uh, satellite, the snow cover data as an input, but uh, we don't have a future snow cover uh, the come from the satellite at this moment. So we need to predict the snow cover the, uh, of the future without any uh, satellite data. So this system can simulate the snow cover itself very well. So that way the, we can uh, apply the, this system for the climate change impact assessment. With regard to the, uh, the crop uh, simulation, not only the water, uh, we can uh, develop the uh, crop uh, the growth by coupling with the crop model. So this case is also the same. The lower uh, chart shows uh, the uh, leaf area index. This is a vegetation index observed by satellite. The upper figure shows the simulation result of our model. What kind of the benefit can be obtained from this one? This is the long-term uh, agricultural drought simulation in Tunisia, North Africa, the, from the early uh, uh, 1980s. 
So the orange line is the national statistics, statistics of the uh, uh, crop production of the Tunisia, and uh, the green line comes from our model. So the, there are two uh, serious agricultural drought uh, in this uh, country. So we can the, uh, simulate the, uh, this uh, agriculture drought very well. So satellite the, uh, data can estimate surface soil moisture uh, by using the electromagnetic wave. Uh, one sensor uh, was uh, the, on uh, Aqua, the uh, NASA satellite. The other one is the Shizuku satellite of the JAXA. But uh, the, uh, our crop model uh, simulates the vegetation growth. Vegetation itself is uh, water. So uh, soil moisture is horizontal water. The vegetation is uh, standing water we can identify that these different water from the satellite. So if we can identify the vegetation water, that means there is a, the water in the root zone. As only satellite, we cannot uh, observe the, the root zone soil moisture, but uh, such invisible uh, water uh, soil moisture can be simulated by coupling the model and the satellite. So by using this kind of the technology, we can the, uh, monitor and predict the uh, drought. This is a case of the, uh, the Somalia uh, drought in 2010-11. By using the ensemble simulation, we can uh, predict uh, the 10-month uh, uh, drought prediction the, in this case. So, uh, and the heavy rainfall that happens so often, in this case, is uh, uh, the, the heavy rainfall in uh, northern Kyushu Island of Japan. During the 12 hours, more than 550 millimeter rainfall happened. So, a lot of the debris flow in the basin. So, the, uh, uh, the debris flow, the uh, cause uh, the, uh, some sediment, uh, the sedimentation, and the, the sediment is transported by flood and uh, change the, the mid-reach, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the mid-reach, the, the topography, and uh, cause a serious disaster. So by using the, the uh, uh, sediment transport and flood physics, uh, we can uh, simulate the uh, debris flow and also the, the, uh, that uh, the sediment transport system, uh, we can simulate the, that uh, uh, the uh, catastrophic the, the, uh, flood disaster, which cause uh, uh, the, uh, the which changes the topographical the, uh, condition and uh, cause serious the damage. So finally, the uh, socioeconomical aspect the, by using the, the fragility curve of the crop uh, production, uh, in this case it's uh, uh, rice production at each stage and each uh, inundation depth and the duration of the inundation, how much uh, uh, the impact on the, uh, the rice production. So then we can convert the, that inundation depth and duration to the economic loss and uh, it can be applied to the climate change impact assessment of the uh, flood, uh, flood on uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the agriculture, uh, the benefit. So, and uh, such kind of the information uh, can be shared with the local legend community, and uh, uh, they can uh, consider the, uh, their, uh, the contingency plan by themselves and uh, each the community of residents develop uh, such a contingency plan, and uh, in the municipality uh, the uh, meeting, they exchange their idea. So in this way, uh, we uh, <laughs> covered uh, the end-to-end -end approach on the climate change adaptation. Finally, I want to emphasize what can realize this kind of the, uh, activity. Uh, we have a Huge volume of data, climate model. Uh, in the uh, IPCC assessment report, fourth era in 2007, 
40 terabyte. In assessment report, fifth, 2.6 petabyte. So huge increase of the data should be managed. And uh, we need to provide the uh, quality information to the user. So uh, veracity of the data and information is strongly requested. And high throughput data from satellite model uh, the, and the radar uh, should be uh, managed in real time basis. And uh, uh, socioeconomical data has a huge uh, variety. Uh, to improve the, the local people uh, activity and the policy maker, we need to visualize the output. Uh, such kind of the, uh, system is uh, important. The, in collaboration with uh, uh, the IT uh, leader, we developed uh, such a, a data system, data integration analysis system uh, with extra volume, large volume the data storage and uh, high performance of the, uh, the uh, IT uh, scientists, the co cooperation, and on the uh, basis, the various the, uh, the domain scientists are now working together by using uh, this uh, uh, system. So uh, this is uh, the Japan's the, uh, the uh, one of the key uh, projects uh, <laughs> of the science and technology and innovation. So. Uh, the, uh, in this way, uh, the, we are now promoting the, uh, this end-to-end -end approach by using the uh, data system and the uh, involvement of the uh, various the domain science group. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Goike. We, we're now going to uh, move to uh, some of our speakers from the private sector. And before we start, I'd like to invite uh, Hiro uh, Nishiguchi, who's the president and uh, chair of the Bosai Forum, which is a, a fascinating group that uh, really tries to bring together a private sector and yeah. public sector on. Good to see uh, you. Andy. Good to see you. Uh, with us, usually we meet in Japan. So yeah, we do. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Okay. Uh, again, uh, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, my name is Hiro Nishiguchi. I'm a co-founder and a president of Japan Bosai Platform. A Bosai in Japanese means that holistic approach to reduce uh, disaster impacts. And uh, with that, I, by the way, uh, my job is to uh, help large corporations to become more innovative. I do it for a living, and so I speak about disaster risk reduction today uh, from that uh, up, uh, uh, angle. Oh, by the way, I have no slides, but I have three messages. Okay. Number one, the, the purpose of Japan Bosai platform is it's in fact a saving before disaster. Then what are we saving? They are uh, people, communities, and economy, and society. And uh, we don't see disaster risk reduction as a charity or donation work we see as a critical component of a national growth strategy. Okay. With that, we have created a focal point of private sector companies in 2014. And in fact, in designing a Japan Bosai platform, or JBP, we had multiple discussion with actually DFDRR, both in, uh, actually particularly in uh, Washington, D.C., sometimes in Tokyo, because we thought that uh, creating such a focal point to work with the international community like you is critically important for to reduce uh, disaster risk reduction and you know, as well saving people before disaster. And we have more than 100 plus uh, companies within, our, within this community and across all sectors. This is not an industry association. And in fact, there is, uh, this is a first time, this is a first cross industry association to work with international community like you. And, uh, the re and uh, we, are, we have actually developed a solution map which uh, describe uh, various technologies and uh, methodology so that we can share with you at your headquarters and also with your head, uh, field offices. And I'm, uh, I will be asking our ED office to send the link uh, to uh, the solution map uh, to the people who are interested in uh, knowing more about it. And uh, 
and th in, the, in, in doing so, in fact, uh, from an uh, innovation perspective, the very interesting uh, phenomenon, phenomenon is happening within the private sector. The, most of the private sector companies are changing their business model, particularly in terms of how to collaborate with other uh, entities. And uh, I would say it is a shift from a vendor relationship to partnership relationship. The vendor relationship is, is like a, this is, I buy, you sell, here's a condition, so let us negotiate on that. That is more like a vendor relationship. And uh, private sector companies are realizing that that is not so sustainable anymore, particularly uh, when we are facing this uh, uh, rapidly changing digital economy and uh, et cetera. So many leading private sectors are changing their business model from vendor model to partnership model. The partnership model is different from vendor relationship, which is that this is what I can do. This is what you can do. Let us create, let us, let us work together to create a better and higher impact, both on social and business sides. That is a partnership uh, relationship. And in fact, uh, many leading uh, U.S., European, Asian companies are adopting this partnership model because no single company can do uh, everything all together. So that's why we work with many sectors together. And I think that this can apply to the collaboration between the World Bank and the private sector. And because what we can offer is very clear. And what you can offer is also very clear. So let us combine two expertise together as a solution so that we can have the maximum impact on our member countries. And uh, that is what I would like to propose. And uh, with that, I would like to introduce two member companies who will present their deep expertise in this area. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Nishiguchi, and thank you for your uh, support and your partnership in Tokyo. It's always been great to uh, have you as a, as a partner, help us uh, connect with Japanese company. Our first uh, speaker from the private sector will be Mr. Toshihiro Hata uh, from NTT Data, and he's going to uh, tell us about some of uh, NTT's experience, in particular in the ASEAN uh, region, and some of the lessons learned in trying to apply Japanese technology. Uh, please come to the podium. Welcome. Thank you very much, Francis. Um, it is my great honor to be here to make a presentation <laughs> at the World Bank headquarters. Um, Entity Data is a member company of JBP, Japan <clears throat> Bosai Platform, just before introduction. And uh, Entity Data is uh, one of the leading system integrators in Japan. So in recent years, uh, <clears throat> we have uh, many natural disasters in the world. And sometimes, uh, we lose some human lives, and we lose some, we, we get some damages for the human properties. So in those situations, uh, I'd like to talk about how ICT, information communication technology, will work to reduce risk of the disaster. <coughs> so this is the contents. The first one is uh, Japan's implementation of <coughs> oh, that's the right. <laughs> okay, so uh, the first one is the Japan's implementation, the flow of disaster information, then the brief overview of uh, disaster management system. Then the three lesson learned from the Great East Japan earthquake. And then uh, I will introduce some examples of the ICT, computer systems, in the 
field of disaster management. One is an uh, integrated early warning system. The second is a disaster information sharing system. And the last one is SNS, social network system, disaster data analysis system. <coughs> so this is a uh, flow of disaster information in Japan. Yeah. Your left side, so it's an information provider. It is shown in red. So at the central government, we have cabinet secretariat, uh, fire defense management agency, that is fire department, a JML, Japan Meteorological Agency. Those are major player or major provider of information, disaster information in the central government. The others are local government. We also have uh, states, uh, cities, towns, etc. They will also provide information. In addition to that, uh, we have some information from telecommunication company, a power supplier, a gas company, and water suppliers. Okay, those sort of things, organizations, will provide disaster information <coughs> to information communicators. That's at the center, uh, shown in the purple color. <coughs> so in here, Japan has two alert systems. I think some of you may have heard of that. One is a J alert. It's a top level, upper. And uh, we have also L alert. It is the bottom. So J alert is a very, very urgent alert information system. Something such as big, big earthquake or such as um, a missile, a rocket. Yeah? Rocket is flying from somewhere to there. So those uh, alert information will be sent by uh, J alert. J alert is this. And the bottom line is a relatively uh, disaster information sharing platform. We call it L alert. L means local, local alert system, because major information provider to L alert is uh, local governments. So I will go into detail for the L alert later on. Okay. This is an um, overview of disaster-related system. Uh, so we classified into three parts. The left side is uh, monitoring and uh, collection, collecting information, such as food, blood information, monitoring camera, etc. This is the uh, information provided. The second one is a system, computer system, which is uh, receiving information from those system or organization, keep it, store, analyze, and sent to uh, medias, the right hand side. Some such as um, emergency warning system through a smartphone, uh, tsunami information display system. This is something like, uh, oh, caution that uh, there will be a there might be uh, some tsunami or something. That is on the road, on the street. Yeah? They ha we have such uh, alert system. <clears throat> so this is a slide, lesson learned from the previous uh, Great East Japan earthquake. The point here is that, okay, if something happens, big disaster occurs, what people will do? What agent will do? So they are very unschooled. Uh, uh, they will access to many, many medias because they want to know what is happening now and what should we do. So they do not only by one media, but they try to access many, many medias. For example, here some people use telephone, some people use email. Some people go to see TV, 
radio or someone may access internet. <laughs> so the point here is we need to provide correct information to a variety of medias, not a, not a one media, because someone may not know what's going on if the person is not access to the media. So for that purpose, <laughs> yes, uh, one thing is an uh, integrated early warning system. So left side, again, if disaster occurs, so information, there is a tsunami, information, earthquake, heavy rain, uh, flood might be a climate change or something, and the volcano. <coughs> Those information will be sent to central system. We call it LRAT. And here, important thing is the bottom line, evacuation order. So evacuation order is issued by local government, such as something governor of the city, because he knows or she knows very well about the area. So if this is happening, okay, I have to, uh, we have to send evacuation order to the residents here. So those information <coughs> will be sent to LRAT. <coughs> then the LRAT system sends the same information at the same time to a variety of media. So cell broadcasting, silence, TV, smartphones. <laughs> the next one is uh, something uh, in the ASEAN member states. <clears throat> Actually, I was an ICT consultant. I am a, still an ICT consultant of the ASEAN member uh, AHA Center. So AHA Center is a uh, ASEAN Coordinating Center for Humanitarian Assistance on Disaster Management. This organization was formed uh, in 2011 in Jakarta. Okay. They constructed a system, that uh, disaster information system, and all other member cities, member company, countries can access to this system. This is quite Good, because um, member states need only the usual laptop or PCs. No need for special investment, because our center invested in that. So the cost of uh, the member states is only, uh, let's say, internet telecommunication cost, or something like that. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> this is a, a photo of the uh, AHA Center in here. Okay. Oh, so this is a you know, SNS disaster data system. Uh, this system is, uh, let's say, so-called big data analysis. So what, it, what this system do is that if many people tweet in the SNS by using keywords, something flooding, or building class or something, the system automatically or always searching that. Then if the many words are there, the system send alert to local uh, staff of the disaster management offices. So this is just an idea, an image of the system. So something like uh, here it shows uh, part of in which area many people is saying about, let's say, flooding, it shows. And then, <laughs> so if the staff want to know more, they click the circle and then go to enlarged system. This is a sample image of Jakarta city, by the way. The number here means uh, number of tweets, which include the word. <laughs> Then further, the, the staff can go further into the system to read real tweeted message to confirm what's happening. For example, and also if the tweet attached a photo, that's fine. The staff can see the photo like this. Then the staff can confirm, oh, we have to do something. 
Okay, this is uh, very, very short and quick. But uh, what I want to say is that uh, well, we want to uh, we will try we want to try to reduce the risk and save people's lives and people's properties <laughs> by having the world rank projects, bilateral or multilateral, whatever. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hata. Uh, I'd like now to call to the podium Mr. <coughs> Isa Nori Yaegashi from um, Jiken Limited. He's going to talk about some of the new technology applied to big infrastructure, I yeah. understand. Yeah. 